Thank you very much, everyone, for coming along today. My name is Kelly Armstrong. I'm an Alliance MLA that represents the Strangford constituency. Um, in the last mandate, I was also vice chair of the Committee for Communities. Um, it's, I have to say, it's a privilege to host you today for this Crushed by the Cost of Living event. I wish we weren't having this event. I wish we didn't have this pressure, but we do. Just some housekeeping today. Um, there's no fire alarm. If there is one goes off, it's real, and we'll get our way outside. Um, if you could turn your phones to silent during the event, but keep them on. I know people say don't put your phones on during the meeting, but keep them on because we would like you to share about this event on social media. If you could use the hashtag, as you can see on screen, crushed by COL, crushed by cost of living, and the hashtag cost of living emergency. I won't keep you too long this morning because there is a very busy agenda and to be honest you don't want to hear me speak and you want to hear the speakers that we have coming along today. Um, there are some MLAs in the room. Could I ask you to raise your hands please? So you can see around you there is a, a, a good mix of MLAs across the room. Um, anybody wants to have conversations or ask somebody what they're doing for cost of living? Here they are. Um, others will be watching online live through the YouTube feed, but I would ask you if you could contact your local MLAs and ask them for an update if they're not here in the room. Um, across Northern Ireland, we are all being harmed by cost of living. You might look at me and go, she's an MLA, she's paid a clean fortune, why would she be harmed? Well, I have family members. I grew up in a housing executive house. I'm not used to having money, to be honest. I use my money to help family. Um, across Northern Ireland, all of our friends and family, all of us in this room, are facing a very tough winter and the as the cost of living skyrockets. Um, whether it's how we hate our homes, feed our families, but the worrying and the suffering heading our way is not good. It will hit homes, including some who will hit the heating crisis or health the heating crisis for the first time ever. Um, we're used to talking about people in benefits and the working poor. Well, it's no longer the working poor. There are many, many families across Northern Ireland who are going to face fuel poverty. And there may only be room for this to get worse. Announcements today by J Jacob Rees Mogg doesn't really clarify how Northern Ireland will receive the proposed energy cap. The announcement suggests that support won't be available until November. That's mu not much use to a family sitting in the cold. Without an executive, it remains unclear how Northern Ireland will receive the support outlined by government. We'll be on the sidelines watching as people across England, Scotland and Wales receive the emer their emergency rollouts. We all know why we don't have an executive. Every single day of inaction due to the lack of an executive is causing deep and lasting damage to businesses and the well-being of Northern Ireland citizens. There are some ongoing political discussions considering key priorities for an executive to deliver. However, there is a key element missing from those discussions, and it's your voices. This is why today this event is so valuable and important, and I'd like to thank Dr. Fitzpatrick and all the organisations who have come together to um, arrange today's event. Now is the time to express your frustration and to share your solutions. All the MLAs in this room have open ears. We need to hear your solutions. And I'll not keep you much longer, so thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for being here today at this really important event. My name is Dr. Kira Fitzpatrick, and I'm a lecturer at Ulster University, and my area of research is poverty, social security, and destitution. Um, and in fact, we're going to see a lot more households fall into destitution this winter unless we see some urgent action taken immediately. That's why our message is time to act now. Um, before I kick off the event, I just want to do a little round of thank yous. I want to thank all the MLAs for coming here today, and I would really ask you, if you can, to stay in the room for as long as possible. We will have people who have lived experience of poverty here today, who will be given the time and space, well, in what the schedule allows, to share their stories um, and to really outline what their fears are for the coming months. Um, so if you can stay in the room for as long, long as possible, that would be much, as pre much appreciated. 
I also want to say a special thank you to all the people that came together to organise this event, particularly my co-organisers who I can see typing furiously at the back of the room, Andy McLenaghan from the British Association of Social Workers, Northern Ireland, and Siobhan Harding from the Women's Support Network, and a whole team of sub groups as well, we had a calm subgroup and an engagement subgroup and everybody has really um, put a lot of effort in to bring this event together. I'd also like to say a special thank you to all those organisations across the sector. We really do have such a supportive community and voluntary sector here in Northern Ireland who have given us some donations um, which has provided us with the resources to live stream this event today um, to support with travel costs um, and also uh, to support tea, coffee and lunch. So thank you so much for that support. Um, finally, what I would say is we are in a very, very tight schedule today. Um, the, those people who are speaking from organisations will have about two minutes to speak and those people who are coming from a lived experience perspective will have three minutes to speak. Have Danielle here in the front row and if people are going very far over. You might hear a little bell ting. Uh, hopefully it's not too intimidating, um, uh, but we do have 28 speakers. We're cramming them into two hours, so I do hope that you understand that we, we are going to have to keep to quite a tight schedule. Before I finish, I just want to really drive home the point today that the Northern Ireland executive reforming is essential in order to protect those people who are in most need this winter, those people on the lowest incomes. We have seen our Northern Ireland executive come together before. They put together a package of measures in 2016 to stave off the worst impacts of welfare reform. The measures that we are suggesting today are all based in and around the social security system. We have suggested these measures because they can be turned around very quickly within three or four days using existing legislation, namely the Welfare Reform Mitigations Regulations 2016. And we know that civil servants in the Department for Communities have experience in administering supplementary payments and we feel that they could hit the ground running with the, the four measures. And just to recap on the four measures, uh, the first one is to pause debt deductions for six months from October to March 2023. Just to give you a, a, a real kind of example of why that would help, um, the Work and Pensions Committee uh, reported that 45% of universal credit claimants have a deduction, an average of £62 per month. If we consider that a single person on universal credit receives £334.91 per month, £265.31 if you're under 25, then that equates to over 18% of an individual standard allowance. So £62 would go some way to supporting individuals to better meeting their, their, their individual needs. We feel that that's a measure that could be put in place now. And the reason for that is, is because there's no outlying cost. So we would really call on the Department for Communities and Minister Hargey to, to actively consider that measure now. The other three measures would require an executive to be in place. One is reinstating the £20 uplift to universal credit and extending to legacy benefits. We have estimated that to cost around £143 million plus for six months. To provide a one-off payment of £500 to those entitled to disability benefits or carers allowance, that would cost around £194 million. And finally, to remove the two-child limit from universal credit and child tax credit, which would cost about £32 million over the period of six months. Now, it's very frustrating for me as an anti-poverty activist and somebody who researches in this area to be suggesting temporary measures that are focused on a six month period. That's not what I want in the long term. We need, and all of us in the sector are coming together to call for the immediate implementation of the anti-poverty strategy, which has been promised since 1998 and we're still waiting for it. That is going to be a long term solution to poverty as well as uh, the report and the review of welfare reform mitigations and the recommendations around discretionary support being put in place immediately. Those are long-term solutions. These solutions that we are asking for today are very much intended to be short-term interventions to get people through the winter time. 
to get people through the next six months, to prevent thousands more households from falling into destitution to the point where they can't afford their basic material needs. So it is unfortunate that I am asking for these temporary measures, um, but we really are in a desperate situation, and that is why it is, it really is time to act now. So without any further delay, I'm going to ask that the speakers um, from our first uh, theme, which is housing and homelessness, they're sitting here in the front row. Um, so I'm going to ask Kate to come up to, to kick off. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kira. Most of the people we help at Housing Rights are on low incomes. We were already worried about their ability to meet their housing costs because of successive cuts to social security safety nets, and now they're dealing with the rising cost of living. We're worried about what this crisis will mean for many people who rent from private landlords. 48% of all private renters here rely on housing benefit or universal credit to pay their rent. That's about 60,000 people in Northern Ireland. Rising rents and a frozen local housing allowance rate mean that as of March this year, 82% of those people who rely on universal credit have a shortfall between the universal credit that they receive and their rent. At March of this year, the average shortfall was £119 per month. That's £119 per month that renters need to find from somewhere else to keep up with their rent. And that's before fuel costs rose, food costs rose. There is some help available through discretionary housing payments, but the budget is set by Westminster, and unless it is increased, it is unlikely to be able to meet demand. We're also worried about what this crisis will mean for people who will struggle with their mortgage repayments. According to the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, we have more homeowners in poverty here than elsewhere in the UK, more homeowners behind on their mortgages, and a higher rate of marginal homeownership. Our advisors are already seeing a growing number of people coming to us having difficulty keeping up with their payments to their lenders. Any available household budget they had to make up extra payments has been swallowed up by rising food and fuel costs. Housing Rights supports today's calls for urgent intervention to provide temporary relief. We also hope that today marks the beginning of real engagement from our government on these issues. An effective government response to this issue should not only tackle disadvantage, it should promote well-being. We hope that, as in other jurisdictions, robust steps will be taken to prevent homelessness for those most at risk because of the rising cost of living. Hi, my name is Rebecca and I'm here as a member of Renters Voice. We're a group of tenants who campaign for change in legislation, policy and practice in the private rented sector. This summer, Renters Voice designed a survey to see how private renters in Northern Ireland have been impacted by this cost of living crisis so far. The findings provide us with powerful personal testimony and highlight the challenges that many tenants face in keeping a roof over their head during this crisis. I'll talk about just a few of the survey findings today. We asked private renters what percentage of their monthly income goes towards rent. Around half reported spending 40% or more of their income on rent. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the general affordability rule that a person shouldn't spend more than 30% of their income on housing costs. The implications of spending more than this are clear. There's less money to spend on essentials like food, transport and bills. That includes home heating and electricity, the costs of which are rising exponentially. We find that 81% of private tenants are currently prioritising paying their rent over these other essential expenses. Spending such a high proportion of income on rent is especially concerning for our respondents who are already starting out on a low income. Around a third of our survey respondents said that their main source of income was from social security or from a pension. These aren't people living beyond their means in expensive luxury accommodation. These are renters who are financially stretched by simply keeping a roof over their head. This finding becomes even more stark when you consider rising rents. Almost 40% told us their rent had been increased since January. Of these, one in 10 reported this happening more than once, with 4% reporting increases three times since the start of this year. All of this financial stress is unsurprisingly taking its toll on private renters. 60% of our respondents reported that their physical or mental health has already been negatively impacted during this cost of living crisis. 
Another 28% said they were worried their health would begin to suffer if things continue the way they are. We gave people the opportunity to tell us about their experiences in their own words. One person said they recently started medication for anxiety and depression due to financial stress. Another said that their stress has resulted in a flare-up of an existing chronic condition. One respondent said that oil and coal is so expensive that they can't put the heating on, which means their arthritis will get worse in the cold. Another person reported feeling very homesick because they can't afford to visit their hometown and their family. Finally, to finish on a direct quote from a mother who responded to our survey, I'm scared that we will end up homeless and that my kids could be taken away from me if I can't afford the basic things my children need. Renter's Voice wants to highlight that these findings were gathered in the summer months when many people were yet to face the harsh realities of heating a home in winter during a cost of living crisis. We're also aware that energy prices are set to rise again in the next month, which will squeeze incomes even further. With this in mind, what will the next few months bring for private renters? When asked about sustainability, 52% of our respondents said that their current renting situation isn't sustainable. Will these people be able to keep their homes throughout winter? Renters Voice believe that without intervention, many private renters will face homelessness, and we call for immediate government action to be taken to address this crisis. For more information and to find out um, our full report, please follow us on Twitter or Facebook. Thanks very much. Good morning, everybody. My name is Patricia Devlin, and I'm from the Extern organisation. Um, Extern are a charity that work across the island of Ireland uh, with families and individuals in need. We will cover a very wide uh, remit of uh, programmes of care, including homelessness, addiction, substance misuse, mental health, learning disability, physical health, and people who have been through the criminal justice system. My own remit is within the homelessness and criminal justice sector. Um, I have responsibility for four uh, hostels, three of which are based in Belfast and one in uh, Cookstown, and that covers a total of 82 beds. We also have a couple of floating support services um, attached to these. So I can echo a lot of what Kate and Rebecca have already said in terms of the individual challenges and choices that people have to face in terms of uh, low income. We also work with people with extremely complex need in terms of mental health and, and addiction and things that impact on people's daily, daily living. And this cost of living crisis, sorry, um, this cost of living crisis um, has impacted directly on people's complex needs and exacerbated them. The challenges are, in terms of low income, dependent on benefits, lack of, host, lack of adequate host, social housing stock, demand far outweighing supply. As Kate has already said, um, the shortfall for people who are trying to pay rent, not to mention deposits uh, in advance, means that uh, independent accommodation is quite simply out of a lot of people's reach in terms of the people that we would work with. Um, the choices that they have to make in terms of managing their mental health and receiving uh, service provision and treatment mean that if they have to travel for appointments and then the choice that they have uh, between either travelling for your appointment or paying your rent or buying your food means that the appointment is the likely one that is going to uh, fall by the wayside. And this means then increased and exacerbation of whatever condition. And if that happens, then the risk of a return to homelessness is very, is very likely. Where, it come, where this is hitting services as well as individuals, last year, for example, one of the units that I have responsibility for is a 14-unit bed, shared kitchen, shared bathroom. The average utility bill, including gas, electricity, uh, your bins, your whatever, um, was £8,000 over the quarter and that's likely to rise to at least £12,000, which is 50k a year, which is a huge amount of money in terms of services that are drastically underfunded as, as it is. And we need these services in order to support the people who are facing the real challenges in terms of establishing themselves in independent accommodation, but more importantly, sustaining that. So the Reactivation of the executive is absolutely vital to make key decisions on funding across the sector so that these services can be sustained and able to provide the support 
to the people who need it the most. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm just double checking, do we have Sean in the room? Sean, there you are. Uh, come on ahead up and... Hey everyone, my name's Sean Cain. I'm a homeless activist. I'm a 41 year old male. I can't work due to ill health. I have COPD, osteoporosis, depression. I struggle each day and I have to use, I've, I've had used some fierce army and food banks in the past. Because of my pride, I'm not asked. I'm afraid to ask for help of my family and friends. They all work and I believe they would be struggling too. I'm a volunteer campaigner with PPR campaigning for homes on the Mac East Side in West Belfast. I'm also a volunteer with reaching out homeless and community support as an outreach worker in, in Belfast City Centre. We have a food bank and we've seen a raise in the numbers using each day. It's just raising and raising. I also took a stand outside the City Hall for homeless on the homeless deaths in our communities. What is the cost of living to me? I see people, families going to food tables to seek help, going to drop in centres just to heat themselves or maybe to eat so they have enough in the house for the kids to eat. Pensioners going to shopping centres to keep warm. A raise in people homeless, family living in hotels, 41 homeless deaths and 14 of them were in a three week period. Mates taking their own lives, food banks on an all time high. Single families struggling to pay school uniforms, schools starting up leftist clubs. Families stressing over Christmas, mums and dads choosing not to eat to buy their kids new things just to keep up with the kids next door. Pensioners deciding on eat or the heat situations, and working class families struggling to buy gas, electric, food, petrol, and chancels at an all time high. While the rich get richer, the working class get pure and the pure die. Our politicians get paid a good wage for doing nothing, only pick over a protocol and bring our government down. When the, when the people need them most, where are they? It's time to get back in the work for the people and fix the messages I've made and do something about the cost of living for people and families can't go on like this. Thank you. Very powerful message. Thank you, Sean. Um, I'm going to ask the health and social care theme to come up and sit in the chairs at the front, if that's okay. And then we will have Roberta from the Northern Ireland Association for Infant Mental Health. But if everybody else could come up and sit at the, the chairs at the front, there will be a wee bit of moving about, don't worry about it. Deirdre, Andy, Teresa, and Diane and Abby will there videos. Okay, okay, brilliant. So thank you for inviting me to talk about the, the impact of the cost of living on our babies and on the parent-infant relationship. You might wonder at me taking part of my three minutes to thank you, but that really does matter because it's the first action that has to be taken to look for and include the baby in your thinking, in your decision making and in every situation. The first 1,001 days of life from conception to age two is a crucially important time in laying the foundation for mental health and well-being throughout the lifespan. During this time, babies' brains adapt to their immediate environment. They have no alternative. That environment influences their brain growth and development. The parent-infant relationship <clears throat> when protected, promoted and resourced is the safe base from which self-esteem, self-regulation and the capacity to engage positively in other relationships and in society is launched. However, we know that the poverty, stress, anxiety and fear 
which typify families' experiences of this cost of living crisis, impact ne negatively on parents' capacity for attentive caregiving. The parent-infant relationship, when deprived in this way, can lead to a loss of parental self-confidence and have an impact on mental health and well-being. For the baby, it can be associated in the long term with lower brain functioning and poorer health outcomes. It is unacceptable that so many babies in Northern Ireland are having their most basic needs for food, warmth, shelter and human security compromised. One family told us, we've come to dread payday. So much goes straight out on rent, oil and electric that we have no more money coming in for another 30 days. A healthcare worker told us, we had to help a mum access charity support because she had no money for the transport needed to visit her baby in the neonatal unit after she was discharged. A single mum in contact with social services said this, I feel like a failure, not a good mother. I am afraid to show my real feelings when the social worker comes to see me, so I smile all the time, even when, I, when things are hard. I feel I must do this, otherwise they will say I cannot look after my baby and will want to take my baby away from me. This is the reality. This is the picture. But opportunity is ever present. Whatever your role, in whatever public service or community service you operate, look for the baby. Support the parent-infant relationship, including in the antenatal period. Direct resources to relieving poverty and the uncertainty for young families because our babies cannot wait. We must act now to provide every parent and infant with the dignity, standards of living, positive relationships and experiences that they need to be stronger from the start. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks very much for inviting me to speak. Uh, my name is Julianne Maney. I'm uh, here on behalf of the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, and I'm a consultant in paediatric emergency medicine in the Royal Belfast Hospital for Sick Children. I also work in the Rowan Sexual Assault Referral Centre, and I also examine children who are victims of abuse for the Police Service of Northern Ireland as a forensic medical examiner. I am no stranger to poverty, and child poverty in particular. But why am I concerning myself with the cost of living crisis when I should be looking after children's health? Well, it directly affects children's health, and we are patching children up to send them back to environments that made them sick in the first place. The cost of living crisis, in the words of a much cleverer man than I, is a potential humanitarian calamity, and Sir Michael Marmot said those very words. Children in Northern Ireland are starting in 2022 from a very poor health footing already. 26% of them live in poverty, and that means that their health is poor, their mental health is poor. Poor children are twice as likely to die as rich ones. I'll say that again because it's shocking. Poor children are twice as likely to die as rich ones. Government policy and austerity since 2010 have caused households to become poorer, and they're seeing an increase in inequality. We're one of the most unequal societies in the world. And that's not a badge to wear um, with pride. The rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer and sicker. I see the effects of poverty every single day. Children who have poor health, poor mental health, parents and children who are skipping meals. They can't heat their homes. They can't come to appointments because they can't afford the cost of travel. Our children are suffering because of a lack of government. They need a functioning executive and for our politicians to get back to work. We need an anti-poverty strategy and an associated funding plan. Our children in particular need further financial support so they can live a healthy life and achieve their full potential. We need cuts to universal credit systems to stop and we also need a single child payment scheme similar to that in Scotland, which has proven to improve health outcomes. Our current children and families are facing intolerable financial stress, 
And you'll say, well, how does that affect their health? Well, failure to make, end meet, make ends meet causes mental health crises. It causes people to be mentally ill. It's not just a period of unhappiness. Oh, I can't afford that today. It's constant and it's very damaging to children. Children's brains are still developing. And if you have a parent with mental illness or you're living an intolerable financial crisis, their brains don't develop the way that other children's brains develop. Also, if they're living in damp or uncomfortable conditions, their lungs don't develop properly. So I would say this to you, to our politicians in the room, this is simply unacceptable for our children. Get back to work, form an executive. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Deirdre and I am a single parent with two children. I used to work as a teacher, but due to domestic violence and um, family court case, I had to look after my mental health and I ended up in the benefit trap. I was one of the first in Northern Ireland to go on to universal credit and unfortunately the flawed system catapulted me into severe debt, affecting my mental health even more. No one knows when they will need the assistance of universal credit. We are never more than two paychecks away from needing social security. The crushing cost of living crisis is affecting everyone, not just financially, but mentally as well. As an active member in my community, I talk to bin men, taxi drivers, and those who work in local cafes and shops, known as the working poor. They are terrified this winter. We are being and have been crushed by the rising cost of living for so many months. Are we going to be that community that is in need of warm banks, sitting, huddling around together to keep warm? It's so degrading and so demoralising, but it may be a reality. Sorry. <clears throat> I really worry about the effects that this has on, because this is a sore topic, that's why I'm swallowing, on children's mental health and some of them children are my children, they're not getting the same opportunities as other children because the cost of living is just, it's too much. The cost of school uniforms has already affected me in September and the children need the full uniform in case of sanctions. I'm trying to get myself back on my feet, but these constant costs continually domino on into so many things, it's just unbelievable. The high rise in gas and electric, food costs rising, and believe it or not, school education isn't free, not even for those in benefits. We're talking art, HE, stationery, you name it, the list goes on and on and on. And people were already stretched before gas and electric hikes, and now winter seems bleak for most, not to mention the children, who no matter what's going on in society, will be expecting Santa to come at Christmas. To be honest, life right now is like a visual image that I always use when I'm speaking of a set of dominoes falling into the next one, into the next one, into the next one, rising gas, rising electric, debt, school uniform, debt, school supplies, more debt, 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 more debt, dominoing into adult mental health, which dominoes into children's mental health. And then I'm the person standing there trying to hold up the last domino because it's going to crush me completely. People were worried last year, people are terrified this year. We don't just need a government to be reinstated, we need an effective government that gets us, that knows what people's needs are. One-off payments are just like a slap on the wrist for people like me, to keep us all quiet until the money runs out again. It's a short-term solution to a long-term problem. Social security needs long-term solutions, not short-term bursts. The reality of what's happening in Northern Ireland is that people won't be able to cope and depression will set in, and that is a reality, with horrible thoughts, and to be quite blunt, there will be loss of life if it's not sorted out. The cost of living crisis has now dominoed into the mental health crisis. People cannot live in a consistent vacuum of cold, hunger and worry, cancelling hospital and medical appointments because they simply can't afford to travel. These are the things we don't talk about. And I'm addressing this directly to our and my MLAs, the people we all put in a position of power to make our lives better. We are seeing a self-serving political system, losing hope and the will to make our communities better. What we need is for you to do something, to actually hear us real people with real lived experiences, because we are crushed. 
and continue to be crushed by that last domino at the point of no return. Thank you for coming. Social work is a profession committed to the promotion of social justice and poverty is a grave social injustice. Poverty is not inevitable, but all too often it is the direct result of decisions taken at the political level or the consequence of indecision and failure of leadership. Poverty limits life opportunities and exacerbates a wide array of social problems, including addiction, mental ill health, as we've been hearing, and neglect. We know, for example, that mental health problems are more prevalent in deprived areas. Department of Health statistics indicate that 33% of people in our most deprived areas could have a mental health problem, and that's 10 percentage points higher than for people living in our least deprived areas. The department's figures also indicate lower levels of life satisfaction, higher levels of long-standing illness, and increased likelihood of loneliness among people living in our most deprived areas. Children in our most deprived areas are six times more likely to be placed on the Child Protection Register. And four times more likely to be taken into care by social services than those in our least deprived areas. The costs associated with poverty are enormous, both in human and financial terms. Taking the example of looked after children, the annual average cost of foster care placement is £24,000 and the average annual cost of keeping a child in a residential care placement is £265,000. I am so angry and I'm sorry that I can't hold it together. Increases in poverty will heighten the prevalence of adverse childhood experiences with associated increased long-term costs, not only for social work services, um, but also for health services, as we've been hearing. It's also going to lead to more young people becoming involved in antisocial behaviour and the criminal justice uh, system. It is so important that we as a society prioritise early intervention to prevent social problems growing in scale. The four asks we're making today are fundamentally important if we are to protect individuals who use social work services. Thanks. Hello, my name is Teresa and I'm an unpaid carer for a family member. I live in a very rural area of Mid Ulster. Um, I suppose what my main responsibility for looking after my family member is getting him his prescriptions, um, getting him his groceries on a weekly basis, and also organising various um, health visits for him. Um, what I have noticed this last while is the cost of fuel has dramatically increased, and also the price of groceries. I'm also in charge of his finances, so I have to be responsible for them. So I'm trying to think what's the best use of his money and how I manage his money and his best interests. Um, it's a very stressful time um, looking after somebody in a care and responsibility role, as stressful as it is because I work part time. I also look after my family. So this is definitely added pressure on me um, and it can be quite isolating as well you know you've nobody really to turn to nobody really to talk to you just get up and get on with it but people are under severe pressure and severe stress and there needs to be something done something immediately done not in the, in the long term something now short term and a short term solution to try and ease the pressure of carers, especially in rural areas. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Diane um, and I wanted to talk to you today about the cost of living. Um, I would have been struggling anyway uh, in 2020. I lost part of my benefit. I, ha I have no reason why I lost it. I was shielding at the time. And I was pretty upset about it. It has been very, very difficult. But um, I wanted to talk about um, how uh, having no money affects people like me. I am a long-term sick person. I have many conditions. Um, and having no money is very stressful. Um, 
Uh, we have gone without an oven since Christmas. I can't get it repaired because it's been repaired before and I've been advised the last time it's dangerous to do that again and it's replaced. So that hasn't happened because there's just no money left. Um, my fridge is sitting full of water. I've got biological drugs in there. Those are very, very expensive drugs. There's about uh, four packets, uh, eight syringes. I'm sure the NHS would not be too pleased with me if my fridge packs up, which I'm worrying sick about. Um, inflation has risen, I think, I believe, to about 9.9%. Benefits went up, I believe, 3%. Now, that there tells anybody that people will not be able to cope. And to allow that to continue on is a willful neglect, I believe, of people. I've listened to a lot of advice from people who don't have the problems that I have, like putting jumpers on and putting tin foil behind your radiators. I would ask you all to look at Ask Me UK and what they say about that. Um, well, not that, but what they say about cold homes. And cold homes for someone like me are quite dangerous. Um, asthma is driven by um, your airway and, and triggers, cold air being one of them. Cold air also um, can encourage viruses, flus, etc., which is something I get more often anyhow. So um, that's not a good idea really for me and, and to, to be st starting to turn off radiators and stuff. I'm extremely worried about this winter. Um, I haven't had any of a summer. I haven't been able to do anything. I've not been able to do anything with myself. There's just nothing. I'm taking hits all over the place. I would ask you to listen to me and to help people like me because, and other people uh, as well, because these types of prices I've never really, I've never really seen this. And, and I really don't have the income to to deal with all of this and I really don't know what we're going to do. I'm not really content with um, going into a, a, a warm spaces because I feel that we should be able to live a more dignified life. It was already been advised to me to go to a food bank. I'm a sick person. If I went into prison today, and rightly so, I would be fed and kept warm. But yet there are many people on the ground here who are, that's not happening for. And that really does need to be addressed when there's profits uh, being made off the Richter scale. I want you to listen to me today and please help me. Thank you. It's very hard not to get emotional when you hear such powerful testimony about people's fears and concerns and the, the woeful neglect, as, as Diane put it there, of our, our, our executive at the minute. Um, I'm going to ask and thank very much all our speakers, very, very powerful from the health and social care theme. And I'm now going to ask um, the work and poverty theme to come to the front, if you don't mind. Thank you so much. Um, and after this theme, everybody can grab a wee cup of coffee and a cup of tea and a biscuit and really kind of take a wee chance to let what you've heard absorb um, into the psyche. Okay, so we've got Connor. I'll let you kick off, Connor. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thanks very much for the invitation. I'm Connor McCarthy. I'm a uh, Joint Branch Secretary of Eunice and Arby here at Branch. Um, I'm going to speak about uh, the working poor, a term that really shouldn't exist. It is well documented that, you know, that health workers are using food banks and also fall into financial hardship. However, instead of talking about the problem, I would like to talk about three practical actions that health workers have raised that could really help. And that is the immediate abolishment of all school meal fees and make all school meals free, as is being carried out in legislative reform in both Scotland and Wales as we speak. Abolish school transport fees and, 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 and deal with the issue around the school uniform caps. It's absolutely a disgrace that children should be hit with punitive outcomes because of issues around their, where they may face poverty 
within their families, and that should immediately end. And it doesn't take any MLA to stop that. That can be stopped at source within the schools. The whole uh, the issue around paying for this in regards to those practical outcomes can be met by the imp proper implementation of a cross, uh, the executive by the implementation of the, uh, the anti-poverty strategy that is meant to be in place well years ago, as other speakers have said, from 1998. And it's absolutely a disgrace that it is still lying on the shelf somewhere in this building and hasn't been implemented properly. If these three practical steps are put in place, it is, we have shown through our consultation with our health workers and also with, our, with members in relation to the cost that they're facing as working families could save a family with just two children up to £1,500 a year in relation to withdrawing the school meal fees and transport costs to school and also issues around uniform. And it's even dearer, obviously, and more expensive the more children you have. It's also vital that we bring about the free nutritional meal for all school children, regardless of household income, because it has proven to be the best way for better educational outcomes and both immediate and long-term health outcomes as well. And it should be put in place. And there's no reason why it can't be put in place. And we're sick, sir, and tired of hearing why things can't be done. It's about time we've started talking about why, how things can be done. And it's not to mention in regards to the issues that people have spoke about here today, and there have been very powerful testimonies about how we can take it forward. Um, from a unison perspective, we want to work with all our MLAs to bring about legislative changes and reform to, to benefit everybody in society. But I have to say that it's gone beyond that in regards to political lobbying. This is not a justice issue. This is not an attack on working class people. And I have very little faith on this building addressing these issues. However, I do have faith in the mass mobilisation of people. I have faith in people. I have faith in our communities. I have faith in the trade union movement collectively to bring people together to address these issues. Make no mistake, I absolutely firmly believe, and there should be a public sector strike to address these issues. I make no apologies for it. I believe that the mass mobilisation of people to address these issues is long overdue. We all have a stake in the game here. We all want to improve our societies. And all the political lobbying in the world won't change anything. We need to come together and we need to organise and we need to fight these issues that our, that our people, our, our neighbours, our friends, our, all our community are facing. And it's time we all mobilise to come together to address these issues. So going forward, um, from health point of view, we did take industrial action um, last year, two years ago, apologies, and we'll do it again if need be. But the bottom line is it's time to address this poverty issue. Enough's enough. No more talk. It's time for action. Thank you. Hi everyone, I represent the Living Wage Free Spa Fast campaign. The real living wage is independently calculated and based on what a person needs to live on. It is currently 9.90 per hour and paid to all of those over 18, unlike the, uh, the national living wage and the minimum wage. And the new rate will, of, the living, of the real living wage will be announced tomorrow and it's expected to take a significant jump. For the past 10 years, we have consistently as a region had the highest rate of employees paid below the real living wage at over 21% compared to just over 14% in Scotland. Recent research by the Living Wage Foundation showed over half of low paid workers report using food banks in the last 12 months. Two out of five low paid workers report skipping meals. And a third of low paid workers cannot afford to heat their homes. Any organisation, including the ones you represent, can sign up as a living wage employer, committing to pay at least the living wage to their employees and contracted staff. Over 11,000 employers in the UK have signed up. Across the water, a record number of employers are signing up in response to the cost of living crisis. Almost 8,000 in England, 2,864 in Scotland, 456 in Wales, but just 55 here. Despite the executive showing great leadership by accrediting as a living wage employer last year, the public sector here has not followed suit. The 24th Council in Scotland signed up as a living wage employer yesterday. All the universities in Wales have signed up, but none here. In 2014, research by NICFA estimated that 35% of workers employed through public sector procurement contracts were paid below the living wage. Councils, universities and health trusts signing up as living wage employers has a ripple effect uplifting the wages of lots of people and influencing their supply chains and local, supply, local employers. 
A crucial missing part of the response to the cost of living crisis is public sector organisations signing up as living wage employers and driving cross-sector place-based living wage campaigns. And if it's an organisation you'd like to know more about the living wage, we're having an event tomorrow at 11 in East Belfast Network Centre. So thank you very much, everyone. Hello, my name is Owen Reedy from the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. We represent 200,000 workers across Northern Ireland and three quarters of a million workers across the island of Ireland. I'm really sorry I can't be at the launch of the campaign today. I'm at meetings in Dublin, which I couldn't rearrange. But I want to stress that we in the trade union movement very much support Kira and all the colleagues from the Cliff Edge Coalition, the Equality Coalition, who are launching this very important campaign today, crushed by the cost of living crisis. Because we know many workers and their families and many people on fixed incomes are going through very challenging and trying times right now. We really need a government in Westminster that actually cares about people and cares about workers. And we need a government in Stormont to enact policies uh, that support workers and that support families, and particularly low uh, income earners on fixed incomes as we come into the winter. We've seen a lot of industrial action, workers fighting back in recent weeks and recent months, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that. And what are workers to do when we don't have a government uh, that is prepared to take the initiatives that need to be done? We very much support the policies that you are outlining and launching today to try and improve the living standards of those on welfare and those on fixed incomes. We will be launching our own campaign, Workers Demand Better, later next month in October 2022, and we know we can count on your support. We really need to see the trade union movement, the community and voluntary sector, and all progressives working together, demanding a return to Stormont and demanding policies that will support working people and people on low and fixed incomes as we go into the winter and beyond. The very best of luck today with the campaign launch and know that you have our full support. Thank you. Hello everyone. I'm Carol and I've come here today to speak to our MLAs to represent the genuine and escalating needs of many ordinary working class people across the community at this time, like myself. I'm a single parent raising two school aged children. I've been a teacher for over 28 years, but since redundancy 10 years ago, I've worked as a supply teacher and I work really hard when work is available. But long term or permanent jobs are like hen's teeth and wages are extremely unreliable. So I depend on the benefit system to supplement income. The cost of living, as you've heard today, is absolutely rocketing. Food, books, internet, clothing, uniforms, school meals, transport, and I pay more in rent now than I ever did on a mortgage. And none of these things are luxuries. The heating oil is up by 121% since last year and electricity by over 36% since only May in my house. I'm also repaying a social security debt because of an admin error on tax credits from a few years ago, not a mistake of my own making. Savings are gone, I've cut back on branded foods, lights and switches are checked obsessively, the heating and the tumble dryer severely rationed. There's only so much managing and budgeting though that anyone can do. It is exhausting, physically and mentally. And I have told friends before that the most exhausting part is trying to appear as if I am not exhausted at all and everything is fine. My mind often physically hurts. And as someone said earlier, I feel like a failure as a parent, as a person, and it's not easy to stand up here and share all this with you publicly today, to be quite frank. Teaching colleagues who are in full-time work still struggle like so many public sector workers. The value of pay has been severely depleted in real terms against inflation and industrial action is being considered. This might well bring outrage from some quarters. The same uproar faced by striking council, postal, transport, housing executive, health or communication workers when they are forced to withdraw so-called key and essential services because energy and food companies do not accept rounds of doorstep applause as payments. 
But the strike action that increasing numbers of workers are having to take or consider is, believe me, a very last resort. And the decisions to do so are not taken lightly. Quite simply, many workers like me are at breaking point and cannot afford to work, cannot afford to live. The situation is not a mere consequence of a single political decision, a pandemic, or even a recent outbreak of war. This crisis is a devastating indictment of the welfare reforms ushered in by many parties here. These reforms must be crushed or reversed to prioritise the needs of working class people. Big businesses enjoy low taxation, exemptions and financial bailouts whilst reaping obscene profits and bonuses. And yet low paid workers face zero hours contracts, soaring private rents and diminished rights to trade union membership. Workers, many of whom put you here to do your job, deserve better. I've been on many rallies for action and hope and yet cost of living campaigns, food banks and so on are commonplace. I'd like to thank the organisers of today's event for the opportunity to speak in the hope of being heard and to any worker who hears this today and feel that I represent them, I'm glad to have done so. Power rests with us and our union keeps us strong. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Katrina and I've come here from Omotron. Um I'm here today to add my voice to Kira's call for immediate action on the cost of living crisis. I'm a self-employed freelance photographer and I specialise in family portraits, which are my main source of income for the past 10 years. Um, I really enjoy and I love my work and I love making portraits to mark special events in people's life, which include newborn portraits, birthdays, anniversaries, all the nice things and events in people's life. Um, my job is to capture these special times and create the photographs for their family albums, which I hope they'll pass down from generation to generation. So my fear is with no disposable income, people will now lose the opportunity to have these special times photographed by me, but in turn, I'm also losing the opportunity to make income from my work um, and a business that I've built up over 10 years. Um, since the start of the crisis, I've had to give up my business premises in Belfast, um, and I've had to move back to my hometown of Oma. A decision that was not taken lightly, but driven by the fact that I'm also a single parent and my main priority is my son's continued welfare and schooling. The situation we face in which the cost of everyday essentials like groceries and bills are rising faster than the average household income has had a direct effect on my core business, with prospective clients having less disposable income across the population, luxury items like family photo shoots are becoming less and less frequent. Purse strings aren't being tightened, they're being firmly tied. There must be action to stimulate the economy and remove the fear that this crisis has instilled in the population. The fear that they cannot put food on the table as utilities and fuels are continually on the rise. As a business owner, I find it extremely difficult this winter to make any plans for my business um, amid the fears. The winter is approaching fast and I have no doubt that this Christmas will be one of the most difficult for our generation unless measures are implemented to assist the taxpayer. The collective message is clear. Protect your population, protect your small businesses, protect your communities and act now. Thanks so much to all our speakers. That was, again, really powerful and so privileged to just be in this room and showing solidarity with people who are facing into this right now and who are calling for action. Um, okay, guys, we're running a wee bit behind, as may be anticipated. Um, I hope you understand. I'm going to ask everybody to go and grab a cup of tea and a biscuit and maybe decompress for 10 minutes or so. Um, and maybe if you could get your wee cup of tea and biscuit and come back to your seat, um, and we'll aim to kick off again even at about 20 past 11, okay? We're at about seven minutes past at the minute. Hello, my name is John Barry, Professor of Green Political Economy at Queen's University Belfast and co-chair of the Belfast Climate Commission. I want to talk about the cost of living crisis, particularly the energy dimensions of this and how it is connected to the climate crisis. Some people call this a cost of living crisis, but I think a more accurate description is a cost of profiteering crisis. 
given how major oil companies, particularly likes of BP, have this year recorded their second highest profits ever in three months this year of £7 billion at a time when people have to make the awful decision of heating or eating. Or if you don't like to call it a cost of profiteering crisis, how about a social emergency? Up there with the damage it can do to lives and livelihoods of the COVID-19 pandemic. Research from the University of York are predicting that in Northern Ireland, come January, 76% of our households will be in fuel poverty. That is spending more than 10% of their income on energy just to stay warm. To me, that's a social emergency. And where do we see the reaction of government commensurate with an emergency that we've seen in the COVID-19 pandemic? There's a problem here we have in Northern Ireland that's unique in Europe. On the one hand, we have some of the worst insulated homes in Europe, and we're also incredibly dependent upon oil for space heating. Why wasn't the government insulating homes throughout the summer when the weather was good? Winter is coming, the kind of phrase from Game of Thrones. We need to investigate ways of rolling out insulation, particularly to the most vulnerable and needy, while at the same time giving people money in their pockets, capping energy costs, increases, and of course, other food and other elements of the cost of living crisis. Research we've done on the Belfast Climate Commission shows us that a blind woman on a galloping horse could see that the single biggest policy that's going to be the cheapest and have the biggest impact on taking people out of fuel poverty and reducing our carbon dioxide, the main gas that's causing the climate crisis, is housing insulation. Provide jobs, give people money in their pocket, improve air quality. But why haven't government done this? People are crying out for help. The government needs to listen to the people and at the same time, listen to the science and the policies we need on tackling the climate crisis. We can do both of them at the same time. Thank you. Hi, hi. my name's Aidan Campbell and I work for Rural Community Network. Um, fuel poverty has been a serious problem in rural communities in Northern Ireland for a long time and it's gotten worse in the last year. We're talking about people who can't heat their homes for significant parts of the winter and maybe can only afford to heat one room for part of the day when it's really cold. About 80% of rural homes run on home heating oil. Heating oil prices are volatile at the best of times, but the price of 500 litres has risen from an average of 231 pounds last September to 526 this September. So it's more than doubled. If you don't have a supplier who offers pay point, then the upfront cost is a massive hit to your budget. Most suppliers want the account settled in seven days, and some, ap some apply a penalty charge if you don't. People in rural communities may be less likely to shop around for oil and remain loyal to their local supplier because they know them and they live in their local community. Oil band clubs, which are, have been a response to this fuel poverty over the last 10 years, usually have a minimum order of 200 litres and offer a discount as orders are pooled in an area and then people can buy in bulk. But they don't cover all of rural Northern Ireland and some are now closed to new members as they all rely on volunteers to price and collate the orders. As Professor Barry mentioned in his remarks, houses in rural areas are often older and they're less well insulated. There are also more older people in rural communities living on fixed incomes and 12% of pensioners in rural areas are living in absolute poverty. Rural homes depend on cars for transport, so the rise in petrol and diesel prices is another pressure on budgets, because for most people, there's no public transport alternative, and they have to run a car. Some people will be forced to try and get by burning coal, but the price of coal has also doubled since last year. And although it might be easier on cash flow, most of the heat from an open fire goes up the chimney. So more people than ever are going to go cold in their homes this winter, and they need help now to stay warm. Any energy support scheme implemented here needs to take account of oil central heating. And we support the four asks set out by Kira uh, at the start of the event as an emergency measure. Thank you. My name is Martin McCartney. Uh, I'm a member of 
Dairy Against Fuel Poverty. I'm also a member of AGNA Consultative Forum, and I'm also a member of the Committee of Forum for Aids and Better here in the city and all our local groups. My problem is the £400 that we're allegedly going to be paid through a certain way, which has not been paid, which we've been talking about getting it paid for the last couple of months. And they're talking now about maybe November, but they can't and they won't seem to understand how are they going to pay that to all the people across the Northern Ireland. And the fact that on the 1st of October, there's how you gas raises going on, there's how you electricity raises going on. That £400 might be worth maybe £200 by the time people get it. And also last week, when Luz Truss was talking about, in the Cabinet about her, in her maiden speech about putting a uh, cap on of £2,500 for energy costs, that is still £50 a week for every household. How are they supposed to make that money and still pay to feed themselves and their kids? It can be done in England. How do they do it in Northern Ireland? The setup of the energy companies in Northern Ireland is completely different from the UK mainland. So how do they expect, if they can't get £400 paid and it's now September, how are they going to get a cash or a cap limit of 2500 Unfortunately, we still have the poor people we always will have. We now have an extra group called the working poor. Young parents, both working, maybe two or three kids at school who can't afford paying out what they need to pay out now with mortgages, with the cost of energy prices. We are not even talking about how can we do anything for them. And I also represent, as I say, the older people who are now trying to make decisions when they go out, like myself, when I would go to a supermarket, not what you want to buy, what you need to buy, and can you afford to buy it? Also, with, with, uh, there was talk about a one full tax for the energy companies, which Ms. Truss said was uh, going to stop investment in one thing or another. The Labour Party turned around and said they have spoken to energy CEOs, and they said there will not be an impact if they put a capital or a one full tax on energies. So, who at this is early staging? Is telling the truth and not telling the truth. And the other thing was that I am a member of an oil buyers club and have been since its inception seven, eight, nine years ago by the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. It has been very good. Up until a few months ago, you were always able to get a discount. In the last couple of months, we can't even get the, the oil distributors to come together to even agree. So not only that, but they were restricting the amount of oil you could buy. So please get on together and we need to do something about this radically. Hi, my name is Dana McCready and I work as part of the energy team at the Consumer Council. We provide consumers with information and advice on energy, their bills and their rights. We aim to represent, empower and protect the consumer through insight-led research. From a consumer perspective, energy costs began steadily rising throughout 2021 and they have continued to rise sharply this year. Electricity prices are 55% higher this year compared to the same time last year. And from October, gas prices will be between 210 to 354% higher than April 2021, depending on where you live. Oil prices are around 150% higher too. This makes the average energy bill for a home taking both heating and electricity together between £2,500 and £3,300 per year, depending on if you have gas or oil heating. This is between double and three times what they were at the start of 2021. This means people are paying between £48 and £63 per week without taking any seasonal variations into account, where it will be higher in the winter months and lower in the summer months. 
To put this into context, the recently published Consumer Council's Household Expenditure Tracker for quarter one of 2022 shows that Northern Ireland's lowest earning households had a discretionary income of £29 per week after essential bills. Much of this will be absorbed by these increasing energy costs that we have been seeing throughout 2022. We know that people are both worried and angry about what is happening. The Consumer Council are continuing to work and collaborate with government departments, suppliers, third sector organisations to help try and provide as much help and support for this coming winter. Thank you. Thank you so much to our energy speakers. I'd now invite the social security speakers to come um, to the front, please. And we're kicking off with Craig. Thanks, Kira. Um, there are around 300,000, or just shy of 300,000, uh, unpaid carers in Northern Ireland. And unfortunately, uh, they have been among the groups hardest hit by the cost of living crisis as it's developed. And that's because Many of those people already faced above average bills for things like energy and food and transport that were linked to their current role. And as the cost of those things ha has increased week by week, um, we're seeing more and more carers falling into financial hardship. And unfortunately for far too many of those people, whenever they look to the social security system for support for the financial pressures they're facing, there's very little support for forthcoming. So carers allowance is the main carer benefit in Northern Ireland and it's worth just over £69 a week or the equivalent of less than £2 an hour. Now to put that in perspective, last year the average household in the UK was spending more than three times that amount every single week for housing, food and transport costs alone. So if you're a carer in Northern Ireland today, what chance do you have of affording anywhere near even the most basic standard of living when the value of that benefit um, is so low. And in that context, I suppose it's no surprise that nearly half the carers told our last state of current survey that they were struggling to make ends meet. And it's no surprise that households in receipt of carers allowance report living in food insecurity at nearly three times the rate of the general population. Now I could go on, I suppose, listing stats like that for ours, but I wanted to share, uh, I suppose, the experience of someone from Northern Ireland who's receiving carers allowance using their own words. And what they've said is, the cost of food and energy has increased so significantly and we're still in shock. We've had to cut back on pretty much everything and if something doesn't give soon, I'm not sure we're going to survive. Now our unpaid carers save the public purse in Northern Ireland billions of pounds every single year and the financial support that they get back in return for that is something that should make everyone in this room and beyond deeply ashamed. So th those carers need an executive to be reformed today and they need intervention to give them the financial support that they need. Thank you. So I'm Nula Toman from Disability Action. Pre this current crisis, we conducted research with disabled people that showed that 78% of disabled people do not feel that they have enough money for a decent life. And that was before all the costs soared. One young woman as part of that research told us, I cannot survive on disability benefits. I have no money for food. My home is freezing and sitting in shopping centres makes me anxious. I do not know how I will survive this winter. And we shouldn't be asking anyone to sit in a shopping centre to keep warm. There are also disabled people who are in an impossible position of rationing access to life-saving machinery because of escalating energy costs. And this is a very, very dangerous situation. It is not um, an extreme statement because we have multiple hundreds of case studies of disabled people who are in this situation. This has become a dangerous routine for disabled people who are having to face an impossible choice that isn't a choice to decide between using their equipment or accessing the basic essentials for daily life. 
Now, my next statement comes with a, a trigger warning. This cost of living crisis will price disa some disabled people out of existence. There will be disabled people who will die as a result of the energy crisis. And this is not um, said to cause concern or upset because we know from the previous experience of COVID that this is what will happen. Disabled people are missing meals. They're reliant on food banks and they don't know where the money is going to come from. From our casework, we know that many disabled people are facing energy bills of between 1,500 to 1,800 per month. Disabled people cannot afford to wait for an intervention. The situation is dire and completely inhumane. Thank you. Hi, um, Caroline Wheeler from Enniskillen, County Fermanagh. I'm the mother of Lee Martin, who is 37 years old, uh, 38 in December. Uh, Lee has a very, has a really rare chromosome disorder called diploid triploid mosaica. He is one of 67 in the world, um, which comprises that he's a six foot two statue squashed into a five foot four. So you can imagine all the organs are compressed. Lee lives in his own two bedroom bungalow in Enniskillen. So therefore he's only on benefits. So he is to uh, live. He's on his PIP and he's on his ESA. And uh, that's all the benefits he gets. And out of his DLA or his PIP, uh, he has to pay through his care package £103 a week. So that's £412 before he even puts a loaf on the table or puts a pound on the electric meter. Jean, he's on now an oxygen machine now uh, from 11 o'clock to 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, and that was, as Lee's health declined, he would probably be in it full time. So at the minute he started an auction about a month ago, which has to run all night again. Life is tough at the best of times, you know, we're trying to manage Lee's health. But then now with an added stress of this winter coming in, of energy prices through the roof, um, I just really don't know. I, I don't want to even look at it that far ahead where I didn't have this worry, you know, uh, pre covid but this year man, is the big worry now of can I afford to keep Lee's home running for him? Um, and that I don't know because until I see um, the actual price of what the way it's going to go, um, yes, he's getting that other £300, but sure, it's gone and electric before you even say boo. Yeah, I really do think our government could be doing a lot more, especially for people that's on... For disabled people that's on a lot of energy costing items to stay alive like we've had one scare without electric back a while ago and um, that i had to drive around to another person's house to get uh, lee on his nebulizer um i've even considered thinking about buying a generator um but then again it has to run on petrol or diesel or whatever it is um and it's going to be more cost so it's just really, you know, I'm just at a complete loss um, to how this winter is going to pan out and how Lee's going to survive this winter because uh -huh. his health is declining at a fast rate uh, with the CPOD, taking an infection. He, now the oxygen has bought him a bit more time. And we mentally, you're living on death row, waiting on the call, you know, so it's, um, it's not a nice place to be. Hello, um, I'm going to apologise for the bluntness of some of the language that's going to be used up front. Um, I'm not very eloquent and I'm just letting you know straight away it will be blunt. I get per month a standard single allowance of £334.91. p. I also get housing benefit for a single man of £355.78. This totals £690.69. p of which I get a DW recovery deduction of £25.12. I then also get a tax credit deduction from 14 years ago of £25.12. So that leaves me with £640, roughly, and my rent is £440. So you can do the maths. I have shared care of three children 
who I have three days a week and two nights. And because it's classed as two nights, that then further reduces me down. I am expected on £200 to heat a house that the government tells me I must have a three-bedroomed house for, for these children that they then don't give me any benefit for. They're invisible children when it comes to giving me benefits, so I have shared care, but not shared benefits. I then have the £50 coming out, and I'm expected to live and provide for them children. The three days that them children are with me, I have to provide. I have to provide the uniforms, I have to provide the food, I have to provide the heat, I have to provide everything. Um, and one parent gets all the benefit. Yet you can pro rata maintenance payments, but you can't pro rata benefits. There is so much wrong with this system. Now, the four things that this pe these people are proposing will provide a short term benefit to people. They will help see us through. But some of the things that are being said here is we're at risk. We're already there. It's not hitting. It's not coming in January. It's here now for the likes of myself. If it wasn't for St. Vincent de Paul and family and friends, I wouldn't be here. I can't afford them. But yet these are all impositions that have been put on me by government. And coming to government, I'm unfortunate because I live in Northern Ireland. I'm unfortunate because I've got a Tory government that I didn't vote in. Completely didn't vote in. It was voted in by English working class racists who do not care about working class people or the poor. I then have parties here who couldn't agree on the colour of shite. <laughs> Let's just put it out there. Now, there is no difference in a poor Protestant, a poor Catholic, or a poor somebody who really doesn't care what you call them. Absolutely no difference. <laughs> now, what I would like to say is, and I'm not going to ask you to go back to work, because the people that are here, it's like preaching to the converted. There's, pe there's parties here that haven't turned up today. Now, if your Britishness or your Irishness is either strengthened or weakened by an imaginary line while people are starving and dying, your nationality wasn't secure in the first place. <laughs> what I would like to say, just as the closing point and to leave it for you, is tonight or today, or the next time you're in your subsidised canteen earning £50,000 or more per year, imagine me four days a week eating beans and toast as my main meal so that I can afford to feed my children when they come to me. That is the reality. Everything else is just powder puff. Thank you. The first trust is a non food bank charity that supports a number of food banks and also campaigns for an end. Um, the first trust food bank in Northern Ireland opened in 2011 in the Arts. Fast forward to today, we are now 22, um, and a much wider network of independent media providers across Northern Ireland. Um, our Food bank parcel use uh, within the Trustful Trust network in, in Northern Ireland is consistently the highest in the UK. It has been for the last five years, and our food banks are incredibly uh, concerned about what the word very is going to bring, and it's highly likely to be our biggest one to call record. Nearly half the people referred to food banks in the Trustful Trust network are in debt to the DWP, and we've been speaking to people who have experience of debt who use our, our food banks. And here are four key things that we learned. Firstly, uh, the design of the social security system sets people up to fail. The five week wait means many people have no choice but to take an advance payment. And that leaves people often starting out with deductions to their benefits, trapping them in impossible situations. Similarly, when the benefit system makes overpayments in error, most commonly with tax credits, people find they're powerless as to when or how the money's clawed back. Secondly, government debt can cause destitution. Uh, high rates of debt amongst people who refer to food banks on our network is no coincidence. People explained how too often government debt pushes them over the edge into not being able to afford essentials of no route out. Number three, the mental health impact of government debt cannot be underestimated. 
Unfortunately, the government is often seen to be a less responsible lender than the private sector. Many found they had better experiences with private lenders because they made it clearer how much was owed and were flexible in considering how much people could afford to pay. Over the summer, we surveyed uh, some more people who were using our food banks who, who were in debt. And after the, um, the uh, first cost of living payments were made, 70% of people surveyed uh, who received their first cost of living payment had already spent all of it when surveyed less than a month later, and almost two thirds have had to use that payment to buy food. Um, so, in terms of addressing this, we support the measures that are, uh, 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 we support the measures that have been announced today. Food banks are an amazing community-led response to need, but to be honest, communities have done far too much heavy lifting in the absence of government intervention, and action is needed. Thank you. Uh, I'm from East Belfast Mission. Uh, we work out of the Skena Centre on the Newton Ards Road. Uh, we are a, a Christian charity. We're working around homelessness, employability, and helping the poor within East Belfast. Uh, Johnny just spoke there about uh, good lenders. We unfortunately had to lift two people who went to the wrong people for money. And £100 became £200 within a week, and then became £400 the next week. And unless we had intervened and the PSNI got involved, that would end up in criminality, where people were being asked to transport goods that were not legal. That's the kind of situation lots of people find themselves in, unfortunately. It is really, really and des desperately sad. The cost of living is crippling people undoubtedly. The mental health impact is huge. We have a counselling service and the waiting list is getting longer and longer because people are needing help with their mental health. The right focus here is on, and what I want to really emphasise is the £20 uplift. We noticed as soon as that £20 uplift was removed, people started knocking our door. So this morning there would have been people looking for top-ups or gas electricity with us, they would have been looking for food, there would have been a line of people waiting for food, and there would be people, I'm going after this to sort out a fridge for a guy, a Polish guy, whose fridge is broken down. That is the reality people are living with day and daily in East Belfast. And it's impacting us in East Belfast Mission. Most of our work is publicly funded, but this part of our work, we rely on donations. And we can't afford to stand in the gap for much longer. I was tempted to type an invoice for about five grand and hand it to one of the MLAs here, to hand to one of the ministers, because we can't afford to stand in the gap much longer. We will, because of our Christian faith and who we are, we will stand in the gap. But you need to realize that we cannot stand there much longer we do need help from government, not for us, but for the community. Again and again, I hear people saying, it is what it is. That is wrong. This is not being living life as it should be. It is what it is, is wrong. Life should be much better than this. And we want to work alongside so many other people to not put sticking plasters on. That's what this is. And that's okay. We need a sticking plaster, let's be real. We need an anti-poverty strategy in engage as well. So please understand, we will stand there. But we need government to stand alongside us, particularly for those most in need. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, this is the last theme now, children and families. So I would ask all the speakers in the children and families section to make their way up to the front, please. And hopefully we can kick off with a video of Alexis. Hello, my name is Alexis, and I am a mother of five who has duty of care towards her children. It is my duty and obligation as a parent to provide even the basic essentials for my children, and that would include the food, clothing, and at least give them shelter. And as the day go by, it is becoming more and more difficult. Initially, you know, if I want to go for shopping for my family and I walk into a shop like Lidl, Asta, I go with 70 pounds, 60 pounds, and I'm able to buy substantial quantity of food for my family. But these days, I have to spend 100, between 100 
110, 120 pounds for the same quantity of food. And this is becoming very, very worrisome. School started recently. And what do I have to do? Because school uniforms are all very expensive. The shoes are very expensive. There was nothing I could do. I just told my children we have to recycle. And that was what we did. We have to recycle all their old uniforms for them to go back. Except those that needed new uniforms to go into A-levels and so on. Those were the ones we had to buy one for. For heating now, what do we do? Every day, for one hour, we heat our hands and so we turn it off. And what's the result? The result is a cold environment, a cold house. And it has come with it its own problem because you now have cold. Even me, cold, you have cold, you have flu. Because, you know, at least constantly heating it for a longer time is no longer there. And these are all worrying. I know, like me, and it's still the same with so many other families out there. Winter is seriously approaching. And as this winter is approaching, it has come with these questions, niggling questions in my mind. This is how the prices of things will continue moving up and up. Will this inflation continue or will it come down? I'm also faced with this question. Will it ever come to a situation where I have to make the choice between do I put food on the table for my children or do I hit the house? I don't know what we're going to do at this point, but these are the worries that face us every day and every day. Do I put food on the table for my children or do I hit the house so that at least we know that we don't catch any sickness? I don't know how it's going to be. But it's our worries that confront each and every one of us daily. And I know it is scary for me. I know, like me too, that it's scary for most families out there. We don't know what to do. But we're all just reaching it and saying, if there's any way this can be affected, if there's any way this can come down, please. Because um, it is scary. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Arich Farah, I work for um, Anaka Women Collectives and uh, I want here uh, to talk about the asylum seekers, women and families uh, we work for and the asylum seekers in, um, in the hotels uh, now, most of them they get eight pounds per person per week for the, for the families of the single moms with uh, children and they have given uh, food uh, three times a day, a specific time and they don't have any uh, like other uh, resources to provide for their kids. They're not allowed to take uh, food upstairs to their rooms so they have to eat uh, 12 to 1 breakfast and then 12 to 1 and 5 to 6. And after six, if the kids, they didn't get like a proper meal, they don't have an access to food during the night. Uh, some of those uh, kids, uh, they were like uh, staying without the schools in this hotel uh, rooms, like for six months. There is a family staying there for 10 months in the, in the hotel. Uh, they have no place uh, to play, no place to go for activities. They can't afford transportation, even to take them uh, different places. Uh, there is like a woman yesterday came to say she will, uh, she will uh, leave the college because she can't provide for the transportation and she can't walk all this way. There is a girl, uh, 16 years old, with brain damage, uh, learning disability, and now she have a report that saying she had a malnutrition and dehydration because she, she doesn't eat the food in the hotel. And the doctor gave like advice to take them as soon as possible to house so his ma uh, her mom be allowed to cook for her and nothing happened. They are there in this situation for four, for four, week, for four months now. So the situation there is horrible and there is a great violation of the basic children's rights going up there. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Uluwashe Huluwalano and I'll be speaking for myself and um, the women's group that I belong to, Anaka Women Connected. Okay, so I'm a mom of three adorable children. Now, some times ago my son went to his club activities and um, they asked him, 
what are you thankful for? And he said, I'm thankful for my family and for food. So they asked him and say, why did you say food? So when he got home and the sister would say it to me and said, guess what? Your son said he's thankful for family and food. And he asked him, so why did you say food? And he said, mom, I need food to grow. <laughs> so I, you know, I looked inward. I tried to look inward and said, you need food to grow. So now with the cost, the rise cost of living, how do we manage this? So get you to shop yesterday, I saw that a lot of things have changed in the prices of, of, of food. You know, trying to buy this, what you can buy for one pound is going to one pound, one pound thirty. So you have to even decide the shops to go to. Either you go to Lidl or you go to Iceland or you go to, you know, you have to also decide that. Now, coming to speak for the women's group that also belong to which area, so so spoken. Anaka Women Connected. We are a group of women in this by first. And what do we do? We are women from different backgrounds. We use our skills to encourage ourselves. And part of the view of the people is to say that we are all facing this. You know, some of their kids, some of them that um, um, their kids go to school, they will have to take um, snacks with them. They can afford it. They will say to you, okay, probably they are living on eight pounds, 35 pounds, you know, by the government um, support. They can't go, they can't do anything else. So this is what we decided in our women's group to also help the women, to say that. We tried to get donations, we got some donations for clothing, to say that, okay, if we're able, to, winter is coming now, if we're able to settle the clothing, then that would be fine. So they come, they picked a lot of stuff yesterday, and um, parents, they are happy. Moms are happy, but we need the government. We don't want to be crushed any longer. But we need the government to do what? To act now. Thank you. Very difficult to follow Oluwashi there. <laughs> um, I just want to speak uh, briefly about the impact of the cost of living crisis on women. So economic crises tend to hit women harder, and this one is no different. Women are generally more likely to live in poverty across their lifetimes, often due to caring responsibilities and the greater likelihood of claiming social security benefits and being in part-time, low-paid work. Single parents, the majority of whom are women, are even more likely to live in poverty. A decade of welfare reform and austerity measures have left the household budgets of women on the lowest incomes under extreme pressure even before this cost of living crisis. With energy and food bills rising, they've nowhere to go to find this extra money, leaving them even more exposed to financial hardship, poverty and debt. Rural women often struggle even more with additional transport costs, reliance on unregulated home heating oil and lack of access to other services. Women are often described as the shock absorbers of poverty in the home, going without food, heat and clothes to protect their children and other family members. Just last week, the Women's Regional Consortium published research on women living with debt. It won't surprise you to know that cost of living issues were all over this research. 60% of the women we spoke to reported that raising energy and food bills were impacting on their debts and their ability to make ends meet. 60% of the women also reported they were having difficulty meeting their debt repayments or had missed repayments, and this was before some of the most recent price increases. This is a crisis, just like the pandemic was a crisis, and therefore it requires a crisis response but we've yet to see any real action to protect people, and we need to see action now as we face into this winter. As you've heard, people are genuinely scared and worried about how they will feed themselves, their children and families, and how they will afford to heat their homes and meet their essential bills without resorting to debt. They want our politicians to listen to their experiences and concerns. They want them to take action that will provide real help to protect them from the harsh impacts of poverty, cold and hunger. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Danielle. Um, I have a son, Jack.
Um, hello, my name is Danielle. Um, I have a son, Jack, who is currently five months old. Um, I'm really worried about the cost of living, um, especially this winter. Um, in the past, I've always struggled anyway. Every winter, they, they keep the house warm, but when I was on my own, you know, I struggled through. I only put the heat on when it was really cold. Um, but I don't have that choice this year with my son. Um, I also struggle with my mental health. I've struggled with my mental health um, a long time and the anxiety of this um, is really causing me a lot of stress and I'm really worried about how the impact of this is going to have on my mental health and thereabouts being able to care for my child as well. So um, it, I think this winter is going to be a detrimental effect for, for me and other single mothers. Um, so yeah, I just would love if um, a storman can do something to help um, people like me um, in this situation. Hi, my name is Christy McCallum. Um, I have four children. Um, I have them who's a disabled. Um, I'm also disabled. Um, living costs a lot at the minute. It's crushing me because it's hard to hard to hard to survive. To be fair, I'm not working. My husband's not working, and uh, with four children, it's really tough. Um, like last year, we had to move the house. That crushed us. To be fair, because we went to a lot of debts. And it's hard to come out at the minute, and especially now it comes to winter. It feels like it's it it's feel why uncomfortable even thinking about it. What's gonna come and what's gonna happen with the living costs and especially the prices and uh, all of that impacting on my anxiety. I have also depression, which is not good to me. And I'm hoping just someone gonna hear. The voice will be speaking and asking for help to do something about it because at the minute it's not only me struggling with it, it's a lot of people the same. So I just would like to help. I would like actually I would like to ask about it and help if it's anyone there who could help us because at the minute I think there's a lot of people going into depressions. There's a lot of suicides. There's a lot of anxiety with other people going on about it and I think it's a lot impact on the other people's lives and everything. So I'm hoping ever someone up there is gonna hear us to help us with it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Megan and I have a seven month old son called Noah. Um this winter I am more or less petrified uh, because of this cost of living crisis, getting the letter in from the gas saying that it's going to go up another increase and that we're only getting so much for our units is worrying me. Um, by being a first time mum and living in a three storey house, trying to heat the house and trying to look after a baby and buy food and use the electric as well. As well. Like electric you have to use for gas. And I'm worrying about the fact that will I have to choose whether to feed and heat feed my baby or heat the house and it's really worrying me um, as a first time mommy um, and with also being off on maternity leave not having enough income coming under my house um, I'm just really worrying about this whole cost of living crisis and where it's going to leave me and with my, also with my mental health struggling with anxiety after a traumatic birth um, so I really really appreciate if Stormin could actually step in and do something about it and help all our single and families and people that are working out there because I'm sure everybody's in the same crisis. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity to, to speak today. Um, we've heard powerful testimony already about people being crushed by the cost of living crisis. Uh, what I want to highlight is how this is an experience shared across the childcare sector and the families who rely on their critical services. The most recent Northern Ireland childcare survey from 2021 revealed childcare providers were already reaching financial breaking point and parents were struggling to access and afford the childcare they needed, using savings, overdrafts, credit cards, even payday loans to pay for childcare. Here's how one expressed it. I have sleepless nights worrying about the cost of childcare. It is soul destroying. That was a year ago. A lot has changed since then and not for the better. 
while parents and childcare providers are having sleepless nights, for many it is felt that those with the power to do something are sleepwalking us into an irreparable crisis. Today's event has to be the wake up call, the alarm sounding for action. Recently I spoke to a nursery owner who highlighted how much their costs have risen for gas, electric, food and staff wages. And the result, the nursery had to increase fees for parents by 14%. She's terrified what this will mean for them. With incomes not keeping pace, parents she knows are struggling, but she has no source of income other than fees. It's her only option, and we anticipate further increases across the sector from October. My team recently spoke to a parent who, if she returns to work full time, once she's paid for childcare, will be just 17 pounds a week better off than if she was not working, 45p an hour, and that's before we calculated in her commuting costs. We must address these issues and we can. We need to value the childcare sector as critical infrastructure and invest in it accordingly. And that requires two things. Of course, we need an ambitious childcare strategy. We know that's in progress, but we need a functioning executive in place to agree and implement it. But now we need to see immediate emergency assistance for the sector with a scheme similar to the COVID-19 Childcare Sustainability Fund that gives money directly to providers to address these cost of living pressures and translates through to parents, such as via the freezing of fees. Otherwise, what we'll see is a sector that's being crushed by a cost of living crisis, compounding years of underinvestment, going from being a sector in crisis to a sector that has collapsed. And that is something that none of us can afford. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tressa from Bernardo's. When I was thinking about what to say today, I thought at the end of this, what could I say that you haven't heard already? What story could I tell you? What story could I tell our MLAs that would drive you to action? Bernardo's is the largest children's charity in Northern Ireland. We're in every single constituency and we see poverty in every single one of our services. Poverty's been here for a long time. In fact, it's the reason why Bernardo's was founded over 150 years ago. When I think about the start of the COVID emergency, there was this feeling that we were all in this together. Communities were rallying around each other. Friends and families were supporting each other. And really importantly, our assembly was there. Our assembly was delivering a lifeline. Northern Ireland solutions to Northern Ireland businesses, families, communities and schools. And what's happening now? Someone said to me recently, as we were preparing for this event, it's a dangerous time not to have an assembly. And I couldn't agree more. This cost of living crisis is here on our doorsteps, and yet the worst is still to come, hurtling down the tracks towards our communities, our families, our children, with nothing in the way to protect them. What are we going to do? Who is going to take action? We need our assembly to deliver for Northern Ireland and we need them to deliver now. Storm it now because news is just coming through the wires that uh, the oil scheme offered by Westminster is about £100 per, per person who is using oil heating. So that will maybe do, what, two, three weeks of oil? 100, point, 100 pounds. So honestly, this is a crisis and we need our politicians to act. And we need our lead parties to get together and to do this for the good of all people in Northern Ireland. Poverty crisis does not discriminate based on any sort of dividing lines that have been ingrained here over the last, you know. How many years? We need action now. We need action for the people. And I'm going to pass over to Andy. Thanks, Kieran. And thanks to everybody for coming. I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to wrap up. I feel a wee bit like I don't need to because Kira has made, the, the, made very clear what needs to happen. Um, 
But just to, to kind of thank everybody, before I do that, throughout today's seminar, we've heard from many, many different voices of the problems that individuals and families are currently facing. Mm -hmm. And I'm always inclined to use the word challenge, but these aren't challenges because challenges are things that you can overcome by yourself. And without intervention, the, the, the problems that families are facing, the difficulties um, that families are facing will not be addressed, will not be overcome. We need help at a political level. Now, in identifying what needs to be done, the individual, individuals and organizations that were involved in planning today's event, we have been specific. We're looking at what can be realistically delivered immediately if an executive is formed. We know there are massive, massive structural problems in society that need to be addressed in terms of, the issue, in terms of poverty, and we need an anti-poverty strategy. But in terms of our four asks for today, I'm going to recap them. We want to see an end to social security debt deductions from low-income households, and that's going to provide breathing space to, and to maximise monthly income. We are calling for the reinstatement of the universal credit £20 uplift and the extension of the uplift to legacy benefits. We want a one-off payment of £500 to those entitled to disability benefits or carers allowance to recognise the additional costs of disability and caring. And finally, we want to see the removal of the two-child limit for universal credit and, tax and child tax credit so that families receive benefit entitlement for every child to ensure no child goes hungry. These asks are achievable, they are deliverable within existing budgets, and they are essential to maintain the well-being and dignity of people throughout Northern Ireland. We have produced a template letter for attendees, so everyone who has watched online and everyone who is here today and registered via Eventbrite, you're going to be emailed a template letter, which we want you to send to your MLAs. Send it to all five MLAs that in your constituency um, to raise awareness of these asks. We've been funded today um, by a number of organisations, um, the Trussell Trust, Extern, Radius Housing and the Rural Community Network. Thank you so much for your generosity uh, in, in terms of providing catering and um, covering the costs of AV, etc. Thanks also to everyone who was involved in making today's events happen. Um, it'd be a very, very long list if I named everybody, so I'm not going to, you know who you are. Um, but I just want to say particular thanks to Trasa Canavan who looked after our um, work engaging with MLAs. Thanks also to Emma Ross and Emma Campbell who've been documenting, uh, photographing the event. Thanks to the AV guys, Guardians of the Flame, um, for their live stream support. I checked before I came up. The room's packed, you know that. I think we've over 500 people watching uh, the live stream as well. You know, <laughs> we knew we were gonna be oversubscribed. We deliberated should we um, provide a live stream. We knew we had to. It's incredible that we have this, this much interest. You know, the, the need for change is undeniable. I want to thank Kelly Armstrong, Kira Ferguson, and Claire Sugden for sponsoring today's event. Um, and most of all, I want to thank Rebecca, Sean, Deidre, Teresa, Diane, Carol, Katrina, Martin, Caroline, Aidan, Alexis, Arig, Olawashi, Danielle, Christina, and Megan. They have been so courageous in sharing their experiences, and they've been so generous with their time. They and thousands of others are being crushed by this cost of living crisis. If you're here and you have political influence, I implore you to use it. The time to act is now. Thank you. Do we have time for Kina? Trasa, thanks for the invitation, and again, thanks for the opportunity to speak. I'm like a lot of MLAs who are here. We're here because, not just because we sat for over two hours listening to events. We live, we are those people. We represent them. We see them every day in our constituency. They're our families. They're people who held our communities together, and then some. So don't be thinking. We're up here and we don't care, because that's not the case at all. No one called the DUP out, not one of you. And they're blocking an executive being formed. They're blocking an anti-poverty strategy. 
they're blocking human rights, equality, and then some. So my ask is for the MLAs who want to be in the executive, making tough decisions about mitigations, regardless how you feel about them, and most of us are here, then acknowledge that. Work with us, we will work with you. But I do honestly appeal to us all. It's really tough when you hear all MLAs, because it's not. All MLAs don't discriminate. All MLAs aren't against equality and human rights, and all MLAs want to ensure that we have a society that actually cares for people with compassion, that doesn't patronise people, and above all else, eradicates poverty. Because poverty and partition have been the most violent acts visited on this island. So, Shane, Gormelga. Thank you, Carl. Uh, could I, yes, I would uh, um, invite just a couple of minutes um, to about half 12, I'll, I'll, I'll res I invite other people to make contributions. What I would say, Carl, is that I did mention on the radio this morning that we don't have any DUP, DUP politicians who did uh, our RSVP. We had one politician that RSVP'd from the DUP and they didn't come along today. And, and I, I did make that clear on the radio um, this morning. And, you know, we're obviously hugely disappointed that we, haven't have, we don't have one single DUP politician in the room today. Um, and I am very ready to to say that publicly because it's a fact um, and that's the way it is and uh, to be one of the, po the, the largest poverty or the largest parties um, and what I said is that poverty does not discriminate and um, it touches every section and every corner of our community and therefore it is massively disappointing that we don't have any DUP MLAs in the room today to hear from the people that we've made space for who are, are facing, who are living this crisis at the minute and that are facing it intensifying. So I suppose it is important to make that clear um, and um, I have no qualms about, uh, about spelling that out. Okay. I suppose the purpose of today's event is to show the strength of support. It's not to blast MLAs. We know that you're seeing this in your constituencies and we know there's great work being done in constituencies and it's really important that we don't politicise poverty. It's really important that we all get together and look for the solutions to this problem. As Kira highlighted, there's actually some solutions that we can take forward without an executive. However, the best solutions will be with an executive and we want to give you this strength behind you to be able to demonstrate the will of people in Northern Ireland for an assembly, for an executive. So it's not about saying one party is doing this, one party is doing that. What I'd really love to see is all our parties getting together and delivering for all of our people. Thanks very much, Jerry, Carl, uh, People for Profit MLA. First of all, I want to pay tribute to Kira and the Trasa and everybody else who organised this really, really important event today. Um, I think Carl McKillen's right to call it the DUP. Uh, we've done it every single time. But also, I think it would be inaccurate and ahistorical to not remember what Stormont did and didn't do when it sat a few months ago. I proposed to reduce rents and freeze rents uh, a few months ago in this place. We were told it couldn't be done. We were told it was outside legislation. Yet Nicola Sturgeon did it in Scotland, and those same parties who told us we couldn't do it were tweeting, saying, well done, Nicola Sturgeon, we need the same here. So we need to have uh, longer than short memories. We need to have a truthful account of what's recently happened in this building. And I, a lot of important comments were made today, but one of the most important things is not just simply just to trust this place when it gets back up and running. And for me, that means being organised, and today is a great start, but also means being organised in our communities, being organised in our trade unions, supporting all those public sector workers who are taking strike action. Why? Because their employers, including government ministers, have failed to implement an above inflation pay raise. What is the, one of the quickest ways of alleviating the, the cost of living crisis? The measures implemented and proposed uh, to be implemented today, but also paying workers above or below inflation uh, pay offer, which health workers, civil service workers, and others have been afflicted. So I think it's important to remember that. And if Stormont is up 
tomorrow, next week, next month. I don't know, because I'm not told what's being discussed in this building, much like people here in this room. We'll have to get organised, because if you look at what they've done in the last uh, few years, it's not implemented a anti-poverty strategy. It's not implemented uh, improved welfare. It's been welfare cuts, poverty wages. So fair play to the organisers today. Uh, I'll be supporting all the demands, but also important people on strike taking to the streets to demand these actions and more are implemented. Fair play. I, I just want to, just before we break up for lunch, and we really are breaking up for lunch now because it has been a long morning, I just want to refocus the room and say today was about creating space for people who have lived experience of poverty. Today was for allowing them the opportunity to speak in the seat of power at Parliament buildings. Today was an opportunity for us as organisations in the community and voluntary sector, as academics and researchers on poverty and social security, as social workers, as doctors, as teachers, to stand beside those people who are facing into the cost of living crisis and make them feel supported. So I would just ask, I can see that there are political frustrations and while I very much understand those political frustrations I just want to refocus why we call this event today and it was to stand firmly with people who are facing into this and it is very unfortunate that the people who needed to hear it today weren't here but I am asking everybody in this room to reverberate the message today tomorrow and in the next number of weeks, we want to stand beside any politicians that are willing to work and willing to provide solutions. So I just feel that's really important to say today because I don't want to, as Trassa said, politicize the important contributions that have been made today by all of our lived experience contributors. I'm going to let Kelly, who sponsored the event, close up and then I'm going to invite everybody for tea and sandwiches. Okay, thank you. I'm going to be quite quick. Um, folks, an executive comes back tomorrow. All politicians in this room have to work together, irrespective of what they've done before the executive is formed or what they do to get the executive formed back again. I commit today on behalf of my party, and I know there's other parties that are here today in the room that want to put people rather than politics first. It's our friends, it's our families, it's our neighbours. We are all one community trying to live through this. We have to do this together. The last time the executive got back up and running was in the back of a nurse's strike. This time, maybe it's time for s this civil action. Please do reach out, as well as reaching out to the MLAs who are not here today, reach out to the Secretary of State and tell him the five million pounds that he could spend on an election could be put into your pockets instead of the hundred pounds that his party is going to give you for oil. For now, get a cup of tea because I am so emotional today. I am done. Thank you.